<laughs> so, all right, we're live. Welcome to another episode of the Monday Light on the Ten Horse Money Monday Light Monday well, Live. I already started off perfect on Ten Horse Money YouTube channel. Got a good crowd in here already. This is this is exciting, man. Got a great guest tonight. Got a uh, Lake of the Ozarks area hammer, Mr. Mark Weesey. And you know what I learned today is that there is a K in Croc O Gator. I learned that. That's my valuable lesson for the day. I, I did a bunch of. Uh, You're right. There is. Because I thought it was C O C R O C. I did a Facebook post this morning and I spelt it C R O C. And then yep. Jay Beffa hit me up. He said, dude, there's a K in Croc O Gator. And I'm like, crap. So I redid as much as I could and tried to polish it on up. But, you know, I, like I said, I was telling somebody, I was thinking, actually, I think I was, I think I told Joey that uh, it doesn't matter. What the name is it's does the product work that's all that's it right cares about that's care right. about so and people know what you're talking about and people know what you're talking about so uh yeah, yeah. Let me, let's say hi to some of the folks in here before we get going i always like to give shout outs first thing off we got jay beffa the man we just spoke with him gary Zinier, mr five pound smallmouth phil Meyer, Meyer. Right yeah man phil put me on the smallmouth um last week we had a banner day caught caught my broke my pb twice missouri pb twice and it was a lot of fun. I, I was just going down there and just hoping to catch a few fish. Right. I had no idea I was going to catch. You guys you know. caught almost, what, 20? I think we caught 18 fish. Yeah. No, 20 pounds. That's five. Uh, probably. Close to it. See, we had nine in the, almost nine in those two, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe 15 okay. or so. Just small mouths. So it was probably 18 because we know you undershoot everything. Yeah. Well, we weighed the two big ones for sure, <laughs> but it was, it was a, it was an excellent day. I had a lot of fun. Stephanie's in here. Colby Baker, Darius King, Andy Leonard. Darius has caught a few smallmouth. He's down yeah. at Kentucky Lake. We got Todd in here, Todd Phelps. Mario's in here. John, good to see you. Joey. Speaking of Joey. Let's see everybody. Football and 10 horse on Monday night. That's right, Barry. Got options. Hopefully you'll stay here most of the time, though. Um, so Mark, man, give us a little bit of background information. Where, where are you from and, you know, what's what's your uh, life travels been? So I guess, uh, you know, I, I've grown up in St. Louis pretty much all my life. Uh, South County, um, Oakville, to be exact, is where I grew up as a kid and uh, moved out to High Ridge, which is just right outside Fenton. So I got quite a commute to go to the Ozarks. You know, it's roughly two and a half hours, two hours and 45 minutes. Um, it, it's tough. I won't lie. It's tough living in the city and, you know, ch chasing the green bass all over the country. Um, when I was younger, I fished a lot of individual stuff like central pro -Ams, kind of where I paid my dues and put a lot of money into it. And, uh, I never, I never started as a co-angler. I went straight in as a professional and just kind of learned a life of hard knocks i won't lie so i don't i don't plan a lot of brush piles and stuff like that i just pretty much pattern fish and you know kind of fly by the seat of my pants depending on the time of year it is and that's really you know how, how i've moved along the whole year whole time talk about those central programs those yeah. are kind of a, a forgotten there, there's a lot of really big names that came from the central yeah Program for days. sure for sure talk a little bit about yeah. that yeah yeah so it was it was awesome. Ernie Daugherty started that. Um, I got in probably going to say right around the early 90s is when I started fishing. Had a lot of uh, good opportunities to actually win some tournaments. But back then I was young and like I said, I was paying my dues. You know, the entry fees back then were like 450 bucks and you fish for two days. They were always on a Saturday and Sunday. They worked out great for me. I would practice Thursday and Friday and then compete on Saturday and Sunday. Um, but definitely like we traveled all over Dardanelle um, was one of the places we went to. I've been to um, places in Oklahoma, like Grand Lake, Eufaula Lake in Oklahoma, uh, Lake Hamilton in Arkansas, and then, of course, Bull Shoals, Table Rock, Lake of the Ozarks, Truman. Um, but it was it was an awesome, 
an awesome deal. And the competition, in my opinion, was better than anything I've ever competed with. The guys were true hammers, so they brought me up right. If you could live anywhere as far as fishing wise, what would be an area that you would choose to live in? I mean, I guess for me, it's hard to say because um, Springfield's closer to home, but you know, I mean, if you wanted to stay in the Midwest, I mean, how can you possibly beat the Springfield area? Um, I don't know. I've been, you know, down South to um, like Lake Okeechobee, uh, the Harris chain, some of the lakes that are in Florida are pretty awesome. And I think part of that's probably just because we don't have grass up here. Our very few lakes have grass. So it's a fun change of pace to be able to go down there and experience the grass fishing. Um, we're typically rocks and wood. Yeah. I, you know, when I was well, probably 20 years ago, that was Springfield was where I wanted to, wanted to move. I almost tried, I worked for the United States Postal Service as a letter carrier and I thought really hard about transferring to Springfield for the same reasons. It's got, you know, it's just close to a bunch of really good solid lakes and yeah. never did it, of course, but that would have been to, to stay in this area. That would probably be my, my pick as well. Yeah, it's, it's tough. So we fish a lot of grass lakes over here on, in Southern Illinois. So when you talk about fishing rocks and wood, that's kind of what, what we strive for. You know, we don't get to right. fish rocks and wood. I don't get to throw a crankbait down the bank at all. Unless I, what, I guess Wren would be the closest. Crab, Wren, Crab, Crab Wren. Orchard. There's a yeah. few places around here, maybe. Yeah, but but yeah. not not to show throw a square bill or a a wart down the down a rip rat bank. It just doesn't happen around here. So it's got to be like early spring before yeah. the grass yeah. really gets going. But so right. I, I'm jealous of that, and you're probably jealous of going and catching and that deep bite. I like it Table Rock. Yeah, that's I saw that super super that deep um. Bite. I think it was called like the Oak Outdoors or something. They had a yeah. um, pretty big tournament down there at Table Rock. And I saw Chad Morgan Taylor was talk, talking about catching fish in like 90 foot of water. Yeah, that's you know, insane. That'd be, we don't have 90 foot of water in like three lakes. Oh, oh, right. So. Yeah, it's a, that's a fun way to fish down there. Um, my buddy Jay Halsey and I, um, heck, this is going back over 10 years ago, but we were down at Table Rock and it was a Angler's Choice Championship and we were literally fishing over 100 feet of water, catching fish on spoons and drop shots, probably down anywhere from 30 to 60 foot. But it was before they had a forward facing sonar. So we did everything on 2D, but literally get out there on the creek channels and just kind of follow the edges of them. And you'd see the shad out there and literally just drop straight down to them. And I mean, it was fast, furious and fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. It was. It was did totally different. Really, the first time we did it, we just kind of stumbled onto it, to be honest with you. We were idling in to uh, throw football jigs on a point, and I was like, man, look at that screen, and we stopped the patrol motor down and target them and drop spoons down, and it was literally every drop we were catching two to three pounders. Wow. Hey, we got to give a yeah, shout-out to was, Brian. Um, Brian's, Brian's tuning in from Melbourne, Alaska, or Australia, Australia I'm sorry. Yeah, nice. that's cool, man. Really cool. See, your name is so big that you're reaching all the way across the ocean. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of grass, though, yesterday I fished a tournament on cedar. We won't talk too much about the tournament. Didn't go the greatest, but I, I caught a frog in 49 degree water. You caught a fish on a frog. I caught a, yeah, I caught a fish on a frog okay. in 49 degree water. So that was cool. That was okay. Cool. Well, let's talk about this. To later. me, it's like 52 degrees was like yeah, that, that, that magic point. number. Yeah. yeah, but 49 degree water. Still caught one on a frog. So I was happy. That was the best thing that was happened it yesterday. It was our it was our only over we caught. It was just short of four pounds. So it's it's interesting you talk about 48 degrees. At Lake of the Ozarks, several years back, the water temperature was 48, and we weighed over 20 pounds on a buzz bait. So they'll still hit top water. But you won't get many bites, but typically the ones you do are big. Yeah, I had two more good ones just nose that frog. They come up and just kind of nose it. That happened twice. And it was right like when the it was within the, within the last hour of the tournament. And that would that would have changed everything. If one of those would have grabbed it, that would have changed everything. Right. We would have been right there. Because we just needed one good fish. And uh it's it's something just it's 
frustrating to see that bite and it not get it. But there's there's nothing you can do about well, it. Well, how many bites did you or how many did you have to do that all day throwing that frog? I mean, I had three. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. it. That's tough. One of them got that's it. Tough. Two of them did was not. Was it slow frog or fast frog? Slow. Okay. So, and the one that got it just absolutely crushed, crushed it, it, just like it was the middle of summer, like the water was eighty degrees. Wow. Or actually, probably like the water was sixty degrees. Right. You know, just killed it. But I don't know. I just figured that was our only shot at getting a big bite, and just putting that, putting that in our hand, and it worked one time. That's all it matters. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not uh I'm not your guy for talking about frog fishing. I enjoy doing it. We went with I went with my son uh to the Mississippi River in Lacrosse for a high school championship deal. And during the practice I got to throw it and it was addicting. It was a lot of fun. When it's when it's on, there's it's probably some of my favorite fishing. I mean, just the and, and unfortunately we don't get a lot of days that it, the lakes that we fish at least they get once the frog bites kind of known in the fall it just everybody's throwing it and you know it, you're just going around the merry-go-round every day you're right uh, but when if you're the one of the first ones to catch it like i guess it was last year last year two years ago i was i was force feeding it and then one day it worked and it didn't matter where you pulled up at you could pull up on the worst looking stretch of bank and you throw it out there and it was like four, five, three, all big ones just jumping all over it. And I was pra- I was practicing for a tournament, so I had all my hooks turned under. I wasn't setting the hook on anything. I was just watching them come up, just pull up to a point, make two casts. One would blow up and leave. Go to the next one, same thing. I was like, oh, we already we got this in the bag, and go up there the next day and nothing. Yeah, Dude, that's when you wish. That's when you wish you caught them, right? Oh, oh my gosh, that's what I told <laughs> Dad after about two hours in the tournament. I was like. I should have set the hook on every one of these fish yesterday <laughs> because there. it was unreal. Yeah, yeah. We've been there. It's uh, I don't know. We do the same thing. Top water fishing, take the hooks off, roll them in, do whatever. And then the next day you come back and it's like, where'd they all go? So they have a mind Michael, of their own. Michael said, we see is a, a jig fishing guru, not a frog fishing guru. <laughs> exactly. I think we're going to get into that here in a little bit, though, aren't we? I think so. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the giveaway. We got 66 people in here tonight. Um, we're going to be doing a really good crock gator giveaway. Um, and the way the giveaways work for – I see a lot of new faces on here. Sometime during the live stream, I'm going to reference Sasquatch. I'm going to ask Mark uh, something or somehow in the conversation, Sasquatch is going to come up. At that time – we're going to guess, you guys guess the number between 1 and 200. Mark's already picked the number. I got it written down over here. And whoever guesses that number is going to win a huge prize package from huge, huge Crocodator. So it's going to be it's going to be good. We'll dive into some of the stuff um, as we get to it in, during the stream. But a lot of good stuff, man. A lot of good products um, from Crocodator. So I'm excited to talk about them a little bit more. That I'm excited about them. Um, I see. I thought I saw something on here. Anybody got any questions coming up? Um, if you got anything you want to start talking about, put them in here. If not, we'll just kind of start touching on some of this other stuff. I, I see you got you guys had a really good finish down there at Grand Lake recently. Was that the? See, I wrote a little little note down here. Was that an Anglers in Action Championship was, down there, Grand Lake? It was the Anglers in Action Championship. Yeah. So I've never fished Grand. Is that? I've I've heard that's a lot like Lake of the Ozarks. Is is that it, true or? It has, it definitely has some similarities. I, I kind of reference Grand as two different lakes. So Sailboat Bridge, which is probably 20 miles above the dam, um, maybe 25 above the dam. When you get from Sailboat Bridge up, it's more of a, the lake is a lot flatter. Um, the water gets a lot more color on the upper stretches. Um, and then once you get down below Sailboat Bridge going towards the dam, I would say, yes, it's very similar to the Ozarks. Uh, a lot of rock. Um, the The other thing is there's there's more flats, though, on Grand Lake than there is at Lake of the Ozarks. So it, they're similar, but yet different. Lots of boat docks. Um, we we um, kind of had a one-two punch going down there. Uh, my buddy Jared Williams and I, we fished together. Jared was um, flipping a jig and I was covering water with top water. And the first day he was, 
I mean, he put a limit in the boat in no time, flipping jig, and then we caught a couple key fish on top water. But the first day, we just – the bigger bites, they just completely eluded us. And um, I don't know, we probably had 12 or 15 keepers each day. Um, just were blessed the second day to catch a big one. I think it was five – call it five and a half on top water. Nice. Yeah. The uh, Crocagator head knocker buzz bait, that X bite with a horny toad on the back of it. That was a key producer for us. And then we actually were throwing the three ace ounce wheezy jig um, is what he was flipping around the docks. So were you able to, were you able to run a pattern throughout the whole lake or, or section of the lake or was it a couple, like a spot thing? Was it just like a little area thing where you were an actual pattern? No, we were definitely running a pattern. Um, so we, we were targeting flats with boat docks, basically. Um, and on the flats, if you could find the stretches where it had some bigger rock, that seemed to be holding them better than other places. And then, of course, the wind was your friend. Um, if you had some wind, it seemed like it made them more aggressive. Gotcha. We've got a question from Mario in here. He says he likes to fish the Lynn Creek area. Are the creeks that are nearby too shallow for a good winter bite? No, I mean, Lynn, Lynn Creek is a phenomenal creek, um, but I don't necessarily think that any of the creeks are too shallow. Um, and I guess it all depends on what you call winter. Like right now, I don't even think we're in winter time fishing at Lake of the Ozarks. I know we're in December, but for me, winter is referenced more by when the water temperature gets down in the 40s. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I, we're kind of in that. It's kind of fall going into it should the winter. Be, it pattern. should be winter by pattern. the calendar. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's yeah. certainly everything's pushed back about three weeks. You know, the spawn was kind of late around here. It was about three weeks. I was I was thinking about this the other day, and I remember talking to some some of the guys around here, and everybody was talking about how everything seems like it's three weeks behind. Yep. Well, that's going to continue on into you know December. It's going to be three weeks behind, and well, we the got, weather doesn't help. I mean, we hell we've had. 70 degree days yeah, we got 70 couple 70 degree days too next yeah week. in front of us right mm -hmm. so yeah it's uh that yeah, water's still around 50 so exactly yeah i mean we were at the lake just a couple weekends ago and heck it was still in the 50s down on the lower end towards the dam it was still almost 60 degrees yeah yep it's kind of in between that that's what was in that tournament yesterday i was i had kind of wrote the punching bite and the frog bite off but it just kept staying like 50, 51. And I'm like, that's right on that bubble. It's, it, it was enough to where you got to take it. You know, there's still a lot of techniques in play where it gets later on in the winter when it gets in that low forties, it we're takes a lot of, of that stuff. Kind of in that in between right yeah, now. Yeah, we're kind of in between. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like uh, the pre-spawn period too. Yep. And that water's coming up <clears> and it's like 48, 49, 50. There's, do you want to throw a jerk bait or you want to go flip or. Yeah, you can do, you start being able to do a lot of different techniques right in that, that, uh, that time so here's another question from tom he says uh do you change jig weights with water temps when and why yes i do um so typically when the water temperature is in the 40s um i typically go to that three eight ounce jig um i like to, i like to throw everything on heavy line 20 pound test. I just, just kind of the way I do it. And just depends on how aggressive the fish are. Um, I always have the standard five ace just because I can cover more water. But if I'm not getting bit on the five ace ounce jig, then I'll pick up the three ace ounce. And it's just a, a much slower presentation. Um, I think it's key when you're fishing that jig, you know, that you give it that hopping or small, short little pops and then let it sit there. Um, especially in the winter time, they're not looking for his, they're going to react, but they're not looking for that jig to be jumping up off the bottom. Basically, you think of a crawfish, you know, when it's cold out, you're not going to have a ton of time, but if one does come out, he's not going to be moving very fast. So you want to try to replicate that. In the winter time, what, what trailer are you throwing? Are you throwing a, a, really 
kick and leg action or are you throwing something that's pretty subtle like a ch- uh like a salty chunk or something like that so i don't really throw much salty chunks i throw a lot of the it just it, it some of it depends on so like if you take a five eighths ounce jig and you put a rage craw on there that will help to slow the fall down you know the two uh, tails on it will flip back and forth but that helps to slow it down and then sometimes like they don't want much movement so truly you got to play around with the trailer quite a bit the jig itself i mean anything that has brown hues or green hues you're going to be fine for colored keep it simple um I mean, I, I pretty much throw peanut butter and jelly at Lake of the Ozarks 75%, 80% of the time. I'll go to some brown purple or brown green, something along those lines. And all my trailers are typically going to be green pumpkin or some shade of a watermelon with fleck in it, something along those lines. Uh, the ring craw, um, the crocker gator has, you know, if you take the 3 a ounce jig, trim the skirt down, you know, trim the top of it and make it more like a spider jig. And then I'll trim the weed guard down and thin it out um, and then put that ring craw on there. Um, that would give you a real small profile bait. We got some ring crawls in there somewhere. Let's see if we can find them. Talking about it's, so- a, it's a great little trailer. No, that's the swamp. Uh, so you think if you're around the fish – and they're feeding on a jig those colors that's all you need is that color like peanut butter jelly most of the time i mean i it's a good place to start now if the water's you know quite a bit off colored i mean i'll tell you first and foremost cold muddy water i'll do my best to leave yep that's the ring car right there and i mean there's lots of things you can do like those little side pieces that are on there a lot of times i'll cut those off and yep, those little side guys cut those off and trim a little bit off of it just to make it smaller, a little smaller profile bait. In the wintertime, it seems like they they want a small bait sometimes. So, but you just got to kind of play around with it. Um, but I mean, it's it's the wintertime can be fun. You don't have to cover a ton of water. You just got to fish it very thoroughly. And I mean, a lot of times it only takes one bank. If you're in the right creek, um, and there'll be a limit of nice quality fish right there on that one channel bank. Mm-hmm. Typically in the winter, when you when you find a you find one, there's multiple ones there. Yes, they they usually school up for sure. Yeah. Uh, Kevin has a question. He says, "Mark, do you ever fish at the 46 mile marker area of Lake of the Ozarks? Any suggestions would be helpful. Stained water is there a deep bite ever?" So I absolutely, let's see, 46 is going to be just a little bit above like Bollinger and Cartwright. That's probably right around the 42 to 43. Um, So he's between Cartwright and Pearson is what I would say. Um, Some of those, some of those creeks on the, I don't really know Northeast, South and West that well on there, but on the same side of the lake is say, Um, Bollinger and Pearson Um, some of those creeks in there they've got some good rock changes I mean for me this time of the year and as it we get into winter it's really looking for like ledge rock or channel type banks that have a transition Um, and some days they'll be on the chunk rock to gravel transition and other days they'll be right on the actual channel bank itself Um, but you just got to fish slow and thorough. A lot of times you can take a, like a wiggle ward or a rock crawler and cover water with that. And then if you get a bite, then you can slow down and really cover the water more thoroughly with the jig. So you're in this time of year, you're using that, that rock, rock crawler or wart as a search bait and then picking that area apart with the jig. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. While we're talking about jigs here, Gary's got a question here. Oh, yeah. Gary wants to know, what is your money jig trailer? I guess it depends on the time of the year. Um, in from after the spawn, I would say uh, Brush Hog is my favorite trailer. Full-size Brush Hog um, throughout the summertime. 
and then in spring and winter or late fall it just kind of changes but the ring craw is big and then the rage craw i mean that's what i've been throwing like when we were there last weekend everything was on a rage craw what jig are you throwing that full-size brush hog on that's a hell of a jig trailer yeah five five a sounds wheezy jig okay yeah okay. i do i do i do cut the top part of it off you know okay. like where, where the two we see jig out there no oh, great we got some of them here we got a whole box of goodies yeah we'll pull one of these out we'll talk about it a little bit while we're on it it's got a, some unique features um so it's a kind of a modified football head yeah that black and blue might be a, i don't know if that'll help or not that looks like the 3a sounds there isn't it that is what does it say yeah that is a 3a it, sounds good pretty eye. good wow yeah. that's impressive but it's got that flat a little bit of flat spot there um got a pretty that's a nice so do you make any modifications with the so so like if I was going to take that jig that jig right there and throw it this time of the year all the way through the winter I would actually cut half of that weed guard off so if you take the top of that weed guard like the part closest to where the line tie is and just okay. hold half of those strands up and then take a pair of scissors in there and cut the bottom half off just to get rid of it so when we designed it the jig is designed specifically because Lake of the Ozarks has so many brush piles, but you can throw that jig anywhere. Yeah. Just like you were lifting that up. Yeah. If you, if you lift half of that up, cut that whole bottom half out right where it meets the head. And then that way you'll have a much thinner weed guard. And then of course I trim the end of it, you know, towards the point, towards the hook point. Um, but like that skirt would for this time of the year and in the winter, you'd need to trim that skirt down. You trim it all the way to the bend, probably, or yep, all the way to the bottom. I'll even take the top part of that skirt if you were to lay that jig and let the top part come out, and I'll cut around there, make it yeah. like a spider effect. Yeah, yeah, like a finesse type jig. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, so that's something you guys can do if you haven't ever done that before. You can buy a full size full size jig, and there's a there's a band that the skirt is tied on with. There's a there's a band right there that holds it all together. You can just separate it and hold the front part of the skirt. Or yep. actually hold the back part like this and let the front part dangle. And you can just take scissors and just yep. trim it right there. And then you have that spider effect, that finesse jig. You don't have to buy a spider jig. I mean, exactly. it's kind of the way to do it, really, because you can get a full-size jig or a spider jig in one jig, just depending on what you want to do with it. Um, and it comes in a two pack, so you can have a full size jig and a, and a spider jig, which is kind of cool. Exactly. And then that keeper that's on there, the two wire pieces. Yeah. That's, that's the real deal. Um, it's kind of hard probably to see in there, but when you put it, when you get your trailer on there, I mean, just the savings alone of having to mess with trailers and have to keep sticking new ones on there. I mean, that keeper holds them on there all day long i mean it's amazing it's got a good stout hook in it too but it's not like overly thick you know no, I, I think i think the hookup ratio has got to be pretty good on this all right it's awesome it's, it's awesome. really sharp too really the other sharp. thing another thing that like probably people don't really think about but with a football jig a lot of times you've got the heavier head and i'm referencing more of the 5 8 ounce and hopefully we'll get the 7 8, seven eight ounce coming out this year or next year um but a lot of times when you have all that added weight it's an easy bait for a big fish to throw when they jump but that weed guard being as stiff as it is it actually pins that hook into the fish and holds it there so it's it's a pretty uh unique concept think you'll people that try it will be impressed with the amount of fish you don't lose once you hook up with them yeah and it's and it has eyeballs always yeah. like that <laughs> that fish it's down there on the bottom and that fish can see it looking look at those eyeballs yeah yeah they I mean, don't like that. It, it's like an extraterrestrial looking thing that's exactly what it looks like et yeah. or something yeah so pretty cool jig man pretty cool jig i haven't I thrown it yet won a lot of money on it that's for sure so how did you get involved with uh, 
crocagator and the design of the Weezy jig? How did that come about? Uh, it, it's a pretty long story, but in a nutshell, uh, Jim, Jim Dell and myself, um, we were talking and Jim was asking if I would have any interest on coming and trying to help promote crocagator. And I told him that I thought highly of the company, you know, Donnie Carroll, uh, was an owner previous to Jim Dell being involved. And I knew Donnie and respected him as well. Um, but I told Jim, I said, there's some things I'd like to see done and I'd really like to, you know, get a good quality jig the way I want it. And he's like, well, let's make it happen. So we started designing and prototyping and testing and it was a process, took a couple of years, bunch of prototypes and trying them out on the lakes and tweaking this and changing that. And at the end of the day, that's what we came up with. There's, you know, with anything, there's a few things I probably would still like to maybe see a little bit different, but day in and day out, that's really the only jig that I throw. And I, I mean, I can make it work for every application. We go to Gunnersville. I catch them down there on it. Um, it doesn't matter where I go. I can catch them. Is I mean, it still something that, you skip around docks too? Is it a absolutely. Skip jig? Oh yeah. Yep. I take a five eighths ounce jig with a full brush hog and skip it in the docks like nobody's seen. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a, the way that that head's designed in there, it actually skip really well. Now, obviously guys that really like to skip, you know, where your sidearm slinging it, skipping that type of stuff. There's obviously going to be things that are much better designed probably, but I, I do more of a pitching technique than an actual skipping technique. Well, you could take this same jig, trim the skirt up a little bit, maybe roll, roll the skirt around to the top and then put um, a flatter style trailer, like a, a beaver or something yeah. like that. That's got, you know, a lot of planing action. I'm sure you could skip that sucker back there just fine. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, my buddy Kelly power and myself, we won, Two boats through the uh, Bass World Sports Classic down at Kentucky Lake. Both events were caught on that Weezy jig. And that was with a um, beaver trailer down there. So you just, you know, every time you go, you got to play around with it and see what they want. So if you're, if you're fishing a jig and it's feeling like it should be going on and you've got your brush hog on there but you're not getting bit will you what are you going to do next is it you think it's a color thing or are you going to change trailers or you just think you're in the wrong location well if it's so the only time i'm really throwing that's going to be in the summertime mm -hmm. and so at lake of the ozarks specifically after the spawn those fish are going to be either on like long sloping points or in or around brush piles um so if they're not hitting the jig, I'll be picking up a swim bait or a crankbait or, you know, targeting some other type of bait. I mean, that's where they're at. They just might not be in the mood for a jig or they might be suspended more in the water column. And, you know, a lot of things, a lot of times with the jig, with those brush piles, some, some days they're down in the brush pile and other days they're suspended on the sides of the brush pile or even on top of the brush pile. So it's, we're getting we're getting more technology with the uh, forward facing sonar and stuff like that. You'll actually be able to tell and pinpoint more where they're at. Years ago, it was hard because when you have 2D sonar, a lot of times the brush pile actually looks a lot like a fish. So you can't necessarily tell the difference that well. But with the new forward facing sonar and then some of the down imaging and stuff like that, it helps as well to be able to see. Yeah, Pro Tungsten has a question. Um, early spring fishing at Lake of the Ozarks. What do you look for? So two, two different two different things that I would say you're going to target. You're either going to be targeting shad eaters, which are going to be fish that are going to be more on flatter type rounded points. Um, those are going to be stick bait fish. Um, possible swim bait, like small swim bait, you know, Kitek type stuff, underspins, things of that nature. Um, and then you're going to have your jig fish and you can catch some jig fish on the gravel banks. And as you get sunny days and they move to the flatter type places, you can catch them there. But 
typically your jig fish are going to be more channel bank oriented. I try to tell people all the time, if you just keep it simple and think about it, like we do is, you know, human beings where we drive our cars on interstates and then we have little roads that come off of the interstates. So your big river channels, that's your main highways that those fish are going to migrate through. And then your Creek channels are what they're going to go into um, at different times of the year. So if you look on a map and follow your contour line, see where your creek channels are, where those creek channels bend or where they, when they bend, typically you're going to have a transition. It's going to flatten out. So they're either going to be front side of the creek channel bend or the down river side of the creek channel bend or where it flattens out or in the channel itself. And once you figure it out, like where they're holding, you can pretty much run anywhere in that creek and duplicate it. I hope you guys are listening because that was some juice right there. Yeah, that's big stuff. I like the way you you broke that down. That's yeah, that, that kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. It, it it really is. I mean, and I've done it all over the the country. You know, when I was fishing, like not know if you don't know anything about fishing and you just want to catch fish, there's always fish that are going to live either around a river channel or a creek channel. And you can truly go and take that. I'm not saying you're going to win every tournament, but you're going to catch fish. If you just want to get out and fish and catch fish, you focus on those creek channels. Um, there's always fish on creek channels. Those are kind of like resident fish. But now when we're tournament fishing, a lot of times we're looking for fish that are active. So feeding fish typically are going to move towards flats and places like that to feed. And that's why when you have wind on a flat point or wind on a secondary point, people are like, oh, I was catching them on points. Well, they're just migrating from a creek channel or pulling up to feed based on that wind being there. And a lot of time it's breaking up some plankton or something like that that's up in the rocks and then some shad are moving in to feed on the plankton and then the bass are feeding on the shad. So... Just, I mean, it's, it is truly simple, but it's, it's also complicated and being able to figure it out on the fly when you're out there during the day, that's what separates, you know, making money and not making money. Well, that's the truth. That is the truth the, that, that real time adjustment. Um, we kind of struggled with that yesterday. It's, it's like some, some days it comes to you and then some days it's like you have a plan and it doesn't work in like two hours. It takes about two hours and you kind of start going man i don't know what to do i didn't right. i didn't plan on this happening because last week this is what was going on and uh but yeah that's 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 the deal with fishing you know the more the more you do it and the more you get more serious about it it's all about making those real-time decisions and adjustments to to figure out what's going on you, you know it changes so much especially like right now this time of year in the spring oh, you know in the summer it's a little bit more consistent in the winter. It's a little bit more consistent, but in these transition periods, it's like the fish are doing stuff all the time and it's, it's tricky. It's really, well, there's a lot of fish doing different 10 different things, 10 different things yeah, and they, you've got to figure out which ones are active during tournament hours and which ones are active in the areas that you're fishing. And they can uh, be spread out. Yeah. Like, like yesterday we caught, you know, we catch, we catch a fish on something like a shaky head. Okay. And then, We'd fish a shaky head for a little bit longer in the same kind of areas, not get bit. Then I'd, I'd pick up a swim jig, slower on a swim jig. I'd, I'd catch a fish after like 10 casts or something. I'm like, okay, they're wanting the swim jig, just kind of work through the grass real slow around the rock. You no had, more, no you more had bites the, in 30 minutes. You had the new rod pattern. Every yeah. Every time you pick up rod. a new rod, you catch another fish. Well, I brought eight rods and I used every one of them. <laughs> and and I, I think the only thing I caught multiple fish on was a shaky head. Yeah, you just got to fish on a shaky on, head. On those days, you just rotate through. That's like, what, what are they, <laughs> what are they, what do they want? It's just driving me nuts. So I finally just well, like, okay, I'm going to go throw a frog. One, uh, one thing, one thing that I've noticed is like when I was earlier on, I used to have all these different colored plastic worms and jigs and, I asked guys when doing stuff for my son with uh, high school fishing and some of the dads be like, well, what color are you using? And I tell them all the time, the color, like colored, it matters, but it really does not matter. Like when we get down to it, if guys can understand and don't overwhelm yourself with colors. I mean, you got light colors and dark colors. You're either going to want to imitate a shad or a crawfish and 
truly and honestly, keep it really simple and don't worry about that as much. It's you're not fishing in the right area if you're not catching fish. I mean, either you need to be on the bottom and you're not on the bottom, you need to be in the middle of the water column, um, needs to be going slower or faster. Um, so th those are things that I would tell people really to focus on is being able to figure it out. Like when you can go out in a tournament day and attack it like it's a practice day instead of having a predetermined plan like, oh, we're going to run over here where we caught three fish yesterday. And then after we get done with that, we're going back to the back end of this creek where we had that big bite. And then we're going to do this. And the winds change directions. It's not sunny anymore. It's cloudy. And here guys are running yesterday's pattern. And so when you can go out and just attack the day, I mean, yeah, you might want to start with something that you learned in practice, but always keep your mind open and, you know, be searching and hunting and pecking for something new um, because that's how tournaments are won. It's being in that moment, like you were talking about, if you can be the first guy throwing that frog. So if you can be the first one that jumps onto the top water bite when it first happens, gives you a chance to win. Or if you're the first guy that runs up the river um, when the fish have migrated to the channel banks and you can catch them, you can win a tournament. Um, in the springtime, the first guy that picks up the spinnerbait when they're going to hit it, if he can figure it out, you're going to win a tournament. So those, those are the little things that I would advise people is when you're in an actual tournament, try to attack it more like you do in practice. And when you can get to that point to where you're fishing like you're practicing, um, you'll find a lot better success. There's a lot to be said about that because I've won a lot of practices, but I've never cut a check on one yet. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, but that's so true. I mean, that, that's so true. It, it, you get – You're one, thinking in practice. Clock, yeah, one, well, once that clock's going in the tournament, you you don't fish as free as right. you did, you know, in practice. Well, I mean, in practice, you're, you're thinking. You're trying to find the next bite. You're trying to find the, the next thing, and it happens, and it happens a lot faster. And then you just give up on it immediately because you already figured that out. You're going to go try to figure out something different. And then come tournament day, you got, like you were saying, Mark, you got 10 preconceived notions in your head or five spots that you're going to go run. And you already got your pattern. You got, you've already, you've already blown your, your tournament day out of the water 24 hours before. Cause you said you're going to go fish this rock pile at seven Oh five. And then you're going to run down here at 10 15. And then you're going to fish this, this riprap transition bank. And then you're going to go flip those other docks at noon. Well, you've already, you've already lost the day. Right. Somebody's going to be on your first spot. Somebody's going to be on your second spot and somebody's going to be on your third pot. And you're, you're already spun out. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's also, it's also hard to slow down when you like say the first, the morning doesn't go the way you thought it would. And you might need to fish slower. That's what I'm talking about fishing a jig. That's one of the toughest things to do is, you're not getting any feedback. Well, it might be because you're fishing too fast, but your mind is wanting to cover water, mm -hmm. wanting to find, you want some feedback. And maybe the only way you're going to get that feedback is to actually slow down. And it's, it's hard to do, man. You got to have a lot of confidence in what you're doing. Yep. You know, yep. that's, that's so important. It's backwards because you want to, you want to make more casts to try right. to get more feedback. And then when you should really just yeah. do the opposite. You just, love, if, if you, but if you break the day down, and you know you have roughly eight hours. You got, say you got three hours to do whatever, to figure out whatever. You need one fish an hour. It's not very hard to catch five fish in an hour. Like, you know, one one per hour. And right. when, you can get, when you can see it happen, like, it's hard, it's hard for people to know. Like, I tell people all the time, I'm like, we still have a lot of time left. You need two fish and you got 30 minutes. It only takes three minutes, four minutes to catch two keepers. So... But and a lot of times, I mean, tournaments are won. And when that, like in the fall, especially that bite, for whatever reason, the last hour, it seems like it's always strong. It's usually good in the morning and it's good in the afternoon. And so the rest of the day is kind of a grind. Um, and so you try to learn everything you can through the course of that tournament day so that when it does get down to the prime time that you're going to put yourself in the right situation. Yes, that's. That's so true. And, and a lot of those, like if you think about um, maybe three of the fish you weighed in, a lot of times those fish will be caught within like a 30 minute time period. Absolutely. Or it may be the morning. It may be noon. It may be 2.30. 
you know? Yeah. So like you said, it only takes, it doesn't take a lot of time to catch fish. It's just when, when does that time period come that they're biting, you know? It's exactly. ideally you want it to happen first thing in the morning. Cause then you can yeah. kind of relax a little bit. I mean, that last time that, that I fished, it was the lakes that we fish in Southern Illinois. It's two over 18. The one where you fished at yesterday. And a lot of folks on here know that, uh, but I had my first, my two overs in the first five minutes. So then right. you can relax because those are the Random, hardest to, yeah. get, to get. And then I got a little nervous because I had three hours left. Three hours later, I still didn't have a, my my shorts, but I knew I could go catch those. Those were fairly easy, but I was just trying to upgrade those two four and a halves that I had in there. So tournament strategies, man. Here's a good question from Joshua Harris. He says he's heard big jigs in the winter, and he's heard finesse jigs in the winter. When would you choose one over the other? For if for me, typically finesse jig, shallower, you know, 10 foot or less, and the heavier type jig, 10 foot or deeper. I mean, that's probably the simplest way I can put it. Um, just because you don't have to wait for it to get down there as long with a little bit heavier jig. You could, gotcha. you could also take, and I don't do it, but you could take a 3 a ounce jig and throw it on 12 or 15 pound test to get that fall ratio. Um, but for me, I mean, with the fluorocarbon line, I can go to bull shoals as clear as it is and I can catch them on 20 pound test. Am I giving up a bite or two? I may be, but I don't break them off and I don't know. That's been my biggest thing in the last 10 years is not losing as many fish. Um, I have lost some and it's, it stings bad, but I look back when I was younger and it wasn't like losing five fish a year. It was losing five fish in a two day tournament and it was like killing me. So you learn, you learn a lot of things and I don't know, I throw primarily 20 pound test on everything fluorocarbon. I, I kind of learned that lesson fishing Kentucky Lake, uh, dragging around those shell bars. I, I used to fish, I, I drag and, and fish a jig with like 14 pounds. Right. And man, you get nicked up. You're having to retie all the time. But if you bump up to 20, it seems like it. it's just it. it's like totally different line. You know, it's, yeah. it's only six pounds of difference, but it just handles so much better. And you don't have to retie all the time. And, you know, you'd set that hook on 14 with a little nick in it. And it's probably going to break off. But if you set that, you know, hook with 20 pound with a little nick in it, you know, you still got a little bit of something there. You have a chance at least. Yeah, you got a chance. I'd rather have the chance than the exactly the bit and jumped and it snapped my line oh, yeah. 30 yards out and got to see the whole thing happen. So right. they jump over there, Kentucky Lake. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, Bill said he was fishing a quarter ounce jewel football jig with a speed crawl trailer Saturday and the fish were just nipping at the pinchers. Is there a change that you would make when that's going on? Wow. I don't know. Um... I don't think I've ever thrown a jig that light. That would have to be on like a spinning rod or something or some light line. <laughs> I, li I like so Mark. I like five, Mark. He said he's put on a 5 8 ounce Crocker Gator jig. That's, that's exactly that's right. The first mistake I think what Mark is trying to, to tactfully say is throw a Crocker Gator. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I mean, I, I do feel that way, but I'm not – I'm truly not that way. Like, I mean, there is good yeah. products from all companies – um, and I think Jewel makes some awesome products. I really do. Um, but the, the thing I would tell them is potentially that jig may have actually been moving too slow for the water temperature. And by going to a heavier jig and creating a little bit more action with it, it might have enticed that the fish to actually eat the bait better. I mean, if it's just sitting there crawling and crawling and this bass is nipping at it, do you think a real crawfish is going to do that? Or is that crawfish going to hop away fast? So that would be my advice. Like a lot of times they want that thing. You got to pop it up, you know, give it a pop, you know, and then not ripping it five feet in the water column, but at least move it a foot or six inches. Um, the same thing a crawfish would do if a bass was coming after it. Think I mean, guys, it. guys, Mark makes a great point there. Go to the creek, you know, this time of the year, early spring, and flip over a couple of rocks and see how fast a crawfish is moving. He's not just crawling around along the bottom when something's coming after him. He's gonna he's gonna get after it a little bit. Yeah. They're not they're not moving at a snail's pace. So yeah, exactly. So that would be that would be the main advice I would have is 
you know, some sometimes the little bit heavier jig, and that's why I like the heavier jig, just allows me to stay in touch with it. And I feel like I can fish it as slow as I want. Um, whether it's quarter ounce or three eighths ounce, if it's on the bottom, it's on the bottom. Now I do I do think like we talked about, you need to make that jig smaller profile um at certain times. And then other times I think you need a big profile jig. Yeah, one one thing I would add, Phil, that may may or may not have made a difference, but I always like to take, especially in cold water, I like to take a spike it marker and just put a little bit of chartreuse on the tips. Um, to me personally, it seems like scent in the winter time or in, in colder water, you know, like in the, in the spawn and in colder water, a little bit of scent sometimes will make that fish kind of, you know, suck it up and hold on to it a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, not in these in the Ozark region lakes. Uh, a lot of those spike and markers have orange on one side, chartreuse on the other. The orange is also good when the crawfish have that orangish color. And there's a there's a certain time of the year, and I'm not, I don't honestly know it, but I've heard about it where they'll have the blue shades. Um, when you can figure that out, that's when maybe you want to try an Okeechobee craw or something like that. Yeah. So I got a question. Crocky Gator is also known for their they're shaky heads. This is the, yep. this is called the pro shaker. Yep. Yeah. Gator shaker pro head is what this is. So when would you switch from a jig to a shaky head or do you fish a shaky head much? So, so absolutely from like starting right now, going all the way until the fish spawn, I'll be throwing, I'll always have a swamp bug rigged up. It's just a unique bait. You know, it's basically a grub with, tentacles on the sides of it um but it works great you can fish it slow the tail puts some good movement to move water yeah that's, that's a yeah that's, that's the, the big bigger, dog right there that's the bigger one grab that little one that, that's a really cool bait yes and they make it i think there's two different sizes is that correct they give you two different sizes yeah there's the senior and then the original swamp bug correct so like i would throw the original one now um the, the bigger one is more warmer water. I'm not saying that you couldn't catch them. I mean, you can catch them on a 10-inch worm in the dead of winter. I mean, they're a bass. They're going to eat whatever. But the, the smaller one you have there is the one I typically throw in the winter time and early spring. And then the other time that I'd use the shaky head um, is going to be like August, like late, late summer, early fall. Um, and I use that on a, like a magnum trick worm or a magnum finesse worm. And then I, I should have said I back up, I'm going to back up in the spring when the fish are getting ready to spawn that shaky head with the magnum trick worm is like, <laughs> it's like candy to the bass is what yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you can just cast it out there and just drag it around and you don't even have to do, know what you're doing. Just bounce it around and they're going to swim off with it. It, the thing I like about this, I, I've thrown this a little bit, and I like this longer shank hook, yeah. and yeah. it's exactly for those little bit longer, you know, finesse type worms. Um, like a, I throw a hog's custom six and a quarter a lot, or like a magnum trick worm, or or just a regular yeah. zoom trick worm. That's that head is is perfect for that. It's got a, I like the center point keeper too. You know, it's you can line it up in the center of the bait. You're not yeah. struggling. You know, you're. Your uh, keeper doesn't want to slide off the side of your worm once you punch that in there. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's got that. You can kind of see that point right there. That's really nice. Um, it's got that flat, flat head for, you know, stand up. You could probably skip it a little bit, but I, I really like that hook. That's the thing that kind of jumped out at me is that that longer shank hook for those a little bit bigger worms. So, yeah. And they also, they also make a, um, a football style it has the football head with an extra wide gap hook in it that's actually the one that i prefer for the swamp bug yeah that's what it looks like looks like all rigged up that's the original swamp bug and that that's a crazy looking bait first time i saw that i'm like what in the heck is that it's like a uh helga mite with a big grub tail or something just something totally different and i mean i would imagine that that moves a pretty good amount of water not just uh, uh, yeah the grub tail but these legs well and the, be the beauty of it is you don't really have to even move the bait that much and it's doing it's doing what it needs to do down there in the water by itself 
Yeah, I'm gonna flip this in the spring. I can promise you that. The senior, that. Yes. yeah, yeah, that's mm-hmm. pretty cool looking bait. I was thinking uh, Carolina rig. You know, you could do you could do a lot of stuff with that. I'm gonna bait. throw that about six inches of water and just hang on. <laughs> yeah, ser- several years ago, uh, Justin Swast won the uh, big bass bash um, on a Carolina rig swamp plug. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. Uh, we had another question in here. Let's. I seen something pop up about Bass and Bob or something. The yeah, it's, he was saying, "Where was that at?" Let me find it again. There it is. Right there. Oh yeah, Matt. Matt had a question. He said, uh, "Are you fishing Bass and Bob Saturday on the Lake of the Ozarks?" And then, what do you anticipate the winning weights? He said the bite was a little bit tough, or has been a little bit tough. Um. Uh, as a as a rule of thumb, I always say twenty pounds is what it's going to take to win on the Ozarks. But who knows? I agree with them. The bite's been a little tough. If I was guessing, I would say it's probably going to be around eighteen pounds. Um, and yes, I'll be there um, fishing. I was not at the last one. We had a little championship for uh, just fish um, circuit that we were in, so I'll be able to fish this one. Well, good luck. Thank Whoa. you. Matt yep. and Mark. That is Saturday? Saturday. Yeah, it's out of Valhalla. Okay. They'll probably be close to 70 boats, I bet. Is that a winter series at Bass and Bob? It, it is. This is the second event. And then um, they typically go every two weeks, but there w- will not be one, of course, on Christmas or New Year's. Um, I apologize. I don't know all the dates, but there's one – this saturday and then i think the next one's not until like january the 8th and then it would probably be the uh, 22nd or something like that would be the one after that so we got 94 people on here that's awesome um if anybody out there is wondering about the giveaway we're going to be doing a giveaway here in a little bit it's going to be a huge crocket gator giveaway and we're going to reference i can't yeah i can say it again we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, but this isn't this doesn't mean we're guessing. We're we're uh, putting that out there yet. I see a lot uh, of new faces. This see is... a lot of new faces. So I kind of want to fill everybody in. We do what we call a Sasquatch giveaway. So here in a little bit, we're gonna reference Sasquatch. Just listen for that word, and when that happens, um, you're gonna guess a number between one and two hundred, and whoever guesses that number, we've already picked the number. Mark picked it before we went live. They're gonna win the Crockett Gator prize package. We'd like uh, to see over a hundred. Yeah, share it. If you guys are out there, share it and uh, share it on your Facebook feed and instagram feed and try to get 100 people on here when it when it hits 100 that's going to be about the time we're gonna we're gonna bust out that question let's see if we got any more questions on here oh yeah this is this is a question i had written down actually um wh- what's your go-to rod and and size when throwing a jig like line size rod reel that kind of stuff <laughs> i uh i like big stuff i won't lie i throw a seven and a half foot um Old dinosaur is what I call it. It's a. It's actually a team Iowa light and tough uh, flipping stick is primarily what I throw my jigs on, and then um, I throw everything on loose, high gear ratio seven seven or higher. You know seven point one or higher, twenty point four carbon. Um, typically, I throw cigar line on all my on all my rods. Gotcha. But it's a, it's a heavy action rod. Um, I think you can get away with medium heavy sometimes, but I don't know. I just, I can tell you stories of six eights and six sixes and seven foot rods and for skipping and pitching and all that stuff. Yes. The seven foot stuff is a lot better, but I've just learned to do it over the years with the bigger rods. And I just feel like whenever I hook a four to five pound fish, I've got control of the fish instead of the fish controlling me. And it just I'm starting to like Mark a lot. I'm gonna think a lot alike. <laughs> yeah, you, you like a big heavy rod. I like rod big too, yeah. heavy rods, big heavy line. I'm a little yeah. more finessey yeah. than you for sure. A little more finessey. Uh, but I like I like throwing a 7 Eleven punching rod though. I got oh, yeah. no problem yeah. jacking on them with 50 pound braid, but I will drop down to eight pound test on a spinning rod. I'm not yeah. scared to. I don't, yeah. Everything in between. I probably catch well, more fish. Don't, just... don't take me the wrong way. We go to the you know to a clear lake and you got to pull out a drop shot with the spinning rod. By all means, I can put six pound test on there and do it. 
See, my eye just twitched a little bit when you said that. <laughs> you can't handle are it. Are you huh? crying? <laughs> no, you, no, you I, a, I just don't. Tissue? I just don't like throwing six pound test line and a spinning rod. You would break six pound test. Yeah, line. you're right. You're but, right. See, you have to be versatile if you want to be able to travel the country. Yeah, I know. That's right. You just got to like, do what you have to do. I like flipping shallow and getting them. So you yeah. can't always do that, though. Oh, I know. I Sometimes know. you have to just lean. I know how to do soft. it. I just don't like doing it. <laughs> I don't. I don't necessarily like doing it either. So he taught care. me how to fin fish finesse. So. I like throw. I throw whatever the, I can get a bite on most of the time and get a decent bite. Right. You know? <clears throat> but um, yeah, I'd like to catch them. I, I mean, like, my actually, you know what? My favorite. My favorite way to catch them the last couple of years has been with an underspin. I just like. I like that swim bait. Underspin, bite. that's something about it. Just that's one of my favorite ways to catch the way it kind of ticks and loads up. And I was catching crappie the other day with a little, like two and a half inch little swim, bait. like a road runner. Yeah. So, well, it was a little uh, Bobby Garland. Oh, it's a little paddle tail bait that they make on, okay. a, on like a 32nd ounce, not a 16 ounce head, 16th ounce head, four pound test. And I caught 12 pretty good sized crappie really? there. But that bite, you know, you're just reeling it in and just goes. Tink. <laughs> Something about that bite, man. There's nothing better addictive. than that that underspin bite though. When you throw it out there and you're just slow rolling around the bottom, and it just ticks and it starts to load. And you just yeah, lean on it a little bit. I love it, man. I love it. And that's the bite. same. That's the same way it is with the regular, you know, big six inch swim bait on seven and a half foot rod with twenty pound test. You know, throw it on a half ounce head and three quarter ounce head and. Same exact thing. I mean, it's, See, you know, one minute he goes from telling me I, I need to learn how to throw a six by yeah. test, and then he starts talking my language again, throwing big swim baits. <laughs> well, I got to bring you back in, right? It's like <laughs> you got to bring me back to center. I get, segue, it. I get it. Segue. <laughs> we covered it all right there. We were my, my real track. My real secret to the finesse stuff is you get the right partner. So my buddy Jared Williams from Michigan, he brings the spinning rods and he does the wacky worms and all that, and then I throw all the heavy stuff. So he's the guinea pig. That's a good partnership right there. Exactly. As long as as long as I don't have to do it, that's a great partnership. <laughs> exactly. It's when you get two of us in the boat together and all we want to do is power fish all day long with heavy line and heavy rods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what happens when Kelly and I get together. So that's why I have to have different partners to fish with so I can experience all the different stuff. It's a, it's a balance. It's balance. It is a balance for sure. Yeah. Uh, Big Mike Fishing Chronicles says, when do you stop throwing a crawl trailer and start using a swim bait boot tail on a jig? Hmm. I can honestly say that I really, so I don't, we don't have grass and I don't throw swim jigs. Um, I guess Jared can answer that question. He throws a swim jig around a little bit, but I do not throw a swim jig at all. I, I don't really even hardly own any, um, but that would be the only time I would even throw a, you know, a, like a kite tack or a boot tail trailer would be on a swim jig. So most of the jig fishing I'm doing is to, typically where the bait is on the bottom. And if it's not on the bottom, it's going to be suspended either under a dock or over a brush pile or some type of structure is going to be there that I'm going to be fishing that jig around. So if you're throwing a jig under a, a dock or in a brush pile, are you looking for a little bit different fall rate than you would if you're fishing a jig on the bottom? T typically I like it to fall fast, but there is times, there is times where they want it to fall slower. Um, and that's where you can play around, you know, like a beaver style trailer, it tends to fall real fast. Um, you get into the rage crawl trailer, it's going to tend to fall slower. Um, but usually when you're, when you're fishing something like that, you're looking for that reaction. And that's one of the reasons I like that brush hog in the summertime is just because it does have the two little tentacles to help give it a little bit of action and slow the fall down a little bit, but it's not as much as some of the bigger trailers. Um, and you can get that thing in and around those brush piles and clank it around, bang it around and rip it up through there and really truly create a reaction bite. Yeah. Uh, big Mike back to the, the trailer thing, I, you know, a menace type trailer, is a really good all around trailer. You can work that on the bottom and it also works good when you're swimming a jig. I mean, a lot of times any jig is a good swim jig. Um, the thing you have to, when, when I make a, when I will make a change on a jig is when I'm fishing grass. A lot of times a football head doesn't want to come through grass as well as an actual swim jig. But other than that, you know, for the most part, any jig you can swim and put, you know, a boot, um, a swim bait trailer on there. 
and it, and it works great. But, but, um, you know, for me personally, I usually, if I'm fishing something on the bottom, just like you said, Mark, it's going to be like a crawl or a twin tail or something. Um, the swim bait is just typically on a, on a, uh, you know, a swim jig for me. Um, that kind of cover. Yeah. Think you thinking the same thing? I was trying, I, I'm drawing a blank. I'm, I'm staring off here. I'm trying to figure out what, what crawl or trailer I use on all my swim jigs. You don't you use a big hammer a lot? I use that. One. I've kind of got away from that. I, I switched. It up I use a, a skinny bit. dipper a lot, or the little dipper. Yeah. Reactions Innovation little dipper a lot, or a Rage Menace. Um, sometimes I'll throw a Rage Craw if I'm fishing really shallow, like less than five feet keep with a swim up. jig, and I, I want that those big flappers and that flat profile to, mm -hmm. to keep them up. Yep. But anything deeper than that, it's going to be like probably like half ounce. Yep. So. That's a great way to catch fish too, swimming a jig. Bass guy nineteen sixty wants to know if you're going to be at the uh, Let's Go Fishing show up in Collinsville next month. I I, I hope to be there. Um, so that is the same time that we have a Bass and Bob Winter Series, and the Winter Series is on Saturday. And I hope to be at the Let's Go Fishing show on Sunday. So if you're coming down, come over to Carca Gator, and I'll be there on Sunday. Sweet. Yeah, Crocagator will be at Let's Go Fishing Show. Correct. We meant to swing up there. We should. We should do that. It's a good, it's a great little show. I mean, yeah, I've been I've been a handful of times up there. Uh, right. we used to make that trip because there's usually it's cold and there's not much going on. So exactly. It's not it's not a bad way to get out of the house for an afternoon. What's your favorite drop shot bait? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's it's just a Frog. Small, small cut tail worm and it's made by um oh see it, this is the stuff i don't know it's uh brown purple is the color it's the only one that i throw other than green pumpkin but it's um yamamoto and then the other company that gary's son started do you know what i'm talking about it's not robo worm is it no, um, anyway, it's just a little cut tail worm. It's truly like four inches long and just nose hook it on there and drop shot it. I have green pumpkin is one color and then brown purple. Those are only two colors I own. That's all I throw. There we go. He said he just bought $50 worth of Weesey jigs, needed to get some new stuff, and he sold you or he sold, so he bought some. That's a good thing. That's awesome. If he has if he has any questions, he can uh, get with me on Facebook, personal message me, and I'll help him in any way he wants. Yeah. What's up, Rich? Good to see you on here. Let's talk about a little bit about some of the stuff that we are going to give away. We've talked about a little bit of it, but probably the thing that kind of put Crocagator on the map was that the head knocker, the buzz bait. I mean, yep. that's this thing right here. Um, has won a lot of money for a lot of people. Let's take one out and look at it real quick. It's pretty unique. I honestly, I hadn't fished one before. Um, and I got some about them. Well, it's been about three weeks ago, but I took that three quarter ounce out. Holy cow. You talk about a loud buzz bait. It's like, I mean, it, it, uh, if it goes by a fish knows it's there. Uh, sucker's got some, so in a, in a really windy condition, you know, like a lot of wind and stuff, it's going to, it's going to bring those fish up, but it's pretty cool bait. It's, you know, it's got a really flat head. That's one of the unique things that I noticed about it. It's got that flat head design, which is going to help it plane, get up yeah, on top of the really water. Quick. Yeah. yeah, it does. It comes up really fast. And of course, you know, it's the blades hitting that head. It's that's what it's designed for. And you can probably actually, I think you could pull it off of there if you didn't want, you know, that knocking yeah. sound. Yep. Uh, the line tie is another cool thing. You know, you don't see this very, very often. Most of them have that kind of R bend. This is actually looped. So your, your line's not going to slide down. You know, one of the problems you'll have with the buzz bait or spinner bait is you make a few casts and your, and your knot slides down the wire there. And it's a pain in the butt. You get a waste of cast, but this is solid. It's a loop. It's not going to go anywhere. So that's I'll tell really you what cool. I like is the, the X bite. It's yeah. the, the naked version. Yeah. Of it, it's I guess. cool too. Um, uh, Put whatever you want on there, and I bet that skips like a dream under some it of those docks. It does for sure. Put a horny toad on there, or 
any of your favorite favorite soft plastic. I mean, I, I throw a menace a lot on a buzz bait. So, uh, uh, and it that usually skips even better. But with this head, I mean, it would be awesome. So yeah, it's a really flat head. One on that X bite, if you put it back up there and you compare those to the other, their standard head knocker. One thing that Jim and I designed when we did that is it has a longer shank hook on it. So the gap from the from yeah, the, it is. the hook point back to where the blade is, it has a bigger gap in there for better hookup ratio. With with the standard head knocker, I think it's imperative to throw a trailer hook on there, but it's not as big a deal with the X bite. Right. I like the double keeper too. That way you can really yeah. You can get underneath some of those docks, or if you do catch catch a pole or catch the side of a dock with it, it's not going to pull that trailer all the way down and have a wasted cast. So, yeah, it's exactly. those little things that you don't think about when you're when you buy something or pull it out of a package. But I think with the X bite, they thought of it all. Yeah, it's it's an awesome bait. I will tell you a little trick. So on the uh, X bite. Every time when I get those, I take the blade off. And if you take the top hole and drill it out, like you have to take the you have to take the rivet off and everything. I mean, it's a little bit of work. Right. But if you drill the hole a little bit bigger on the top and then just a little bit bigger on the bottom one, it'll really help make it squeal and squeak. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that or not, but it's a pretty awesome little trick. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've never done that, but um I've heard it be, it's kind of like hanging it out the window for on the way to the, you know how many buzz baits I lost as a kid doing that. <laughs> I'd hang them up there and let them squeal for a day or two, forget about them. They'd wrap up and boo, down the highway they went. Yeah. Grab one of those smaller ones. There's like a quarter ounce in there. Three eighths. Yeah. There's a quarter. Yeah. This thing is nice and petite. I like that. So, what's your take on, you know, buzz bait size like a quarter ounce versus a half ounce versus a three quarter how do you how do you make that decision i i don't really throw anything but the big ones i have i throw some small i throw some small ones like around little farm ponds and i will say though like a few times i've been around grass um i've thrown i've thrown some of the small ones around grass um i was down in toledo bend and this is going eons ago. Down there, we were burning little small buzz baits over the top of the grass, and it just didn't seem to get hung up as much. And I don't know if it was just the way it was burning across the grass or what it was, but it was like late May, early June, and, and they were just crushing it. I mean, we were having a ball. Well, that head design will help keep it out of the grass. Correct. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's that's a that's a neat looking little buzz bait. For a quarter ounce. I mean, so this is the quarter ounce, and then this is the half ounce. So quite a bit. I mean, quite a bit of difference. It's not. It's not just obviously the weight. There's a weight difference, but there's a lot of difference in the profile of of the two buzz baits. Um, I like. You know, I kind of like a quarter ounce in the fall a lot. Of course, typically yeah. in, in a white, I'll throw a white a lot more in the fall than I do black. But um, for me, I, I just I, I get a lot of bites on that quarter ounce. The other, thing, the other thing that works pretty awesome is you take that half ounce bait and put the same blade that's on the three quarter ounce. It's a it's a little bigger blade on the three quarter ounce, but you yeah, can run is. that you can run that same blade on the half ounce. Well, that's a that's a three quarter there, and there's a half, so he definitely a little bit yeah. bigger blade. Yeah, yeah. Jay Beffa was telling me about that. I think that's one of the tricks that he does. He takes a half ounce frame and puts a three quarter ounce blade yeah. on there it works it works really well especially yeah, really especially like as we start to get colder water temperatures you can really slow it down so what do you where when do you cut it off on a on a buzz bait is it 50 degrees or do you go a little bit degrees is about the end of it yeah i'm not saying that you couldn't like truly force it usually you know right when you get around 50 degrees kind of time to throw the towel in yeah. right uh, another you gotta crocodile has some pretty unique soft plastic i thought i thought that you know the swamp bug we looked at that while ago there's also that um muskrat that? yeah well here's the muskrat which is pretty cool it's kind of a you know a beaver style bait yep you gotta have one of those in your lineup 
this is uh right now this you need to be throwing this right now on a jig it's a great trailer for a jig this time of year yeah. and i mean you can take that same bait texas rig it um i, I used it down in uh okeechobee not okeechobee but harris chain flipping in the grass with it you know we put a heavy sinker on there and peg it and it was great for punching yep yeah i, I punch a similar bait to that quite often yeah love definitely that. that's a that's a I good love that bait. profile it's a, it's a great thing. like you said it's it's good for anything around wood punching flipping whatever jig trailer it's pretty multi-purpose this is uh just black and blue muskrat that's what that is those two little those two little appendages that are on the side some sometimes i'll pull them off you know if i don't want as much action just pull them right off and then trim part of that down and you can use that as a perfect jig trailer too yeah so just get rid of these and yep there you go yep. it just looks like two crawl pitchers down there exactly and it doesn't have a ton of action but it has enough action to move water right got the zapper jig here too yeah talk about the zapper jig a little bit it's it's a good it's a really good jig i um i don't personally throw it that much um it's a little bit thinner wire hook um but very well designed the head and the skirt and everything are you know they fit nice together um i think it it works great if you like to throw a little bit lighter line and stuff like that um but you know it comes in different sizes lots of different colors um does that one have the new round rubber skirt or is that the silicone skirt uh that is a round rubber so so they have they had um the round rubber skirts and i i played around with them actually put them on the wheezy jig and they're they're good um some of the some of the colors are a little bit i would say more vibrant than what i would like to see and i was talking with joey about some of it in some of it's out of necessity with the way the world is today with getting supplies and stuff like that. Um, a lot of the products been back ordered and I don't want to get too much into it, but they're going to have the, the silicone skirts coming back as soon as they're available. But I think we're going to try to also keep some of the round rubber skirts. They flare awesome in the water. I, yeah. That's I, definitely what I noticed when I first pulled this out of the package. I mean, that's straight out of the package. And that it's got a lot of flair. Yeah. Well, if you look at that, the Sweezy jig, let's see. Let me show you the difference. This is the flat. I mean, it's, it's flat gonna, silicone versus the round. But see, the, the Weezy jig has what they call a hole-in-one skirt to where the skirt is completely attached to the... Um, the centerpiece, they're not like individual strands, so you can't pull those out. Okay. Okay. So it's a different type of skirt. The collar and the skirt are like all one piece. Gotcha. Whereas on the other jigs, they go into the collar. Yeah, you could you could actually pull, and I'm doing it could, right now. Right. You could pull them out. You can pull one uh, individual strand out. Yeah, and if you pull it off there, it's going to actually tear off. Yeah, that's that's not going anywhere. That's solid. Right. I didn't realize so that. It's just the, the difference in the products, but but the, the they have some colors in the the round rubber, in my opinion, are better than any silicone. I mean, I was I was throwing them on my jig actually down at Grand Lake this fall. Mm -hmm. When we got fourth place down there, it's like a, a brown and greenish color. I apologize, I don't know the name of it, but it was awesome. That's all you need is a brown or a green jig. I mean, amen to that. Amen what's to those, that. Uh, what's what's those other? Is this some other colors of those zapper jigs in there? There's a white one. There's a white one. There is a. That's a jig. That zapper jig's a great little swim jig. If you look at the way the head's designed on it, yeah. Swim, that thing is a great little swim jig. So I threw that. I've thrown that a couple times and you know, one of the things I like to do when I get a product that I haven't fished before is especially something I'm dragging on the bottom is I like to go through an area of the lake that I know really well that I've fished other, say other jigs through that area because I know the snaggy spots and I know kind of how the other jigs handle. And so I, I had the, I just tied a black and blue zapper jig on and went down through that area and it comes through, it comes through cover just fine. 
you know, I had no problems. It was a rocky area and there's a little bit of wood mixed in. It's kind of a, it was a channel swing bank. Um, so as far as coming through cover, it does a, does a good job. That's a peanut butter and jelly PB and J color. Yeah. Is that a zapper? That's yeah. a zapper. That's a zapper. So is, is there a difference between the zapper and the zapper HD? So the, the zapper has a thinner wire hook and the HD has a, um, stronger heavier hook i was wondering when you said that because when you were talking about the the wc jig and i had this zapper in my hand this is the hd i didn't realize it was an hd until you pulled out that I, one i was throwing the hd the other and day. and you were talking about the hook i'm like man that hook is pretty stout in that, that hd oh, gotcha so, <laughs> yeah so let me see let's let's compare the hooks yeah definitely a different hook in in both of those yeah, yeah. there's the two different hooks because i'm a i'm a heavy wire hook Got yeah, it. yeah. It's definitely a finessier hook, um, and definitely a beefier hook. And the weed guards about the same, really, in both yeah, of them. They're they're both same. They're yeah. I would call them medium. I really like that weed guard and the Weezy jig. It got a yeah, pretty stout weed guard on it. Yeah. I will say though, the guys need to play around with it. Like, unless you're using a heavy action seven and a half foot rod and you're really ripping putting the coals to them you you got to really get after them to get that hook to go through there um but i mean that's that's what i do and if you don't want to fish that way then you need to trim that thing down a little bit um but it's there if you need it when you get around heavy cover and stuff it's the only jig that i can actually throw in those piles and get it through them right well, that's the main thing. You don't want to be jerking exactly. on that brush pile trying to knock it free. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. No, you got options. You know, it's, it's like if you need that heavy weed guard, you got it. If you want to trim it back, you can trim it back. If you want a finesse jig, you just trim off the top of the skirt a little bit. There you go. That's the flat, the flat silicone. You know, it's not quite, it's not near as bushy. Where's that otter at? That it's uh um, oh it's yeah. that one it's it's got that otter tail on it. That's a pretty unique little bait. I think that's really cool. Check them out. Oh here it is. Here it is. Yeah, check this little bait out, guys. I think that would be a really good jig trailer too. Yeah. So that that is the beaver bug. It's called a beaver bug. It's called an otter, but it's it's like the swamp bug, but it's got this paddle yeah. tail. That's, that's a knockoff of the swamp bug. Yeah, it's really cool bait too. So these are, you know, what we've shown you to shown you tonight is going to be in the giveaway. You're gonna you're gonna have a couple different colors, um, maybe some different sizes. You're gonna have some zapper jigs, some weezy jigs, some of the different soft plastics, some of the buzz baits, all in um, great colors too. Yeah, all in great colors. Got some tubes too. Yeah, I love tubes. I call, that's what I caught on my smallmouth. Most of my smallmouth on the other day on a on a I stupid tube. Out of the side of his mouth. Yeah, I did it on purpose. I, I like to share. I, I like to share. <laughs> it probably hurts me. Sharing is caring. That's right. Let's see if we got any questions on here. Um. Oh, let's see. What is the do you do you know the date and location of the? Yeah, it's right here. January seventh, eighth. Okay, 9th, got it. Gateway Center, Collinsville, Illinois. Okay. Be there. Be Moving square. on. Okay, Tim's. This is kind of. We can all chime in on this. He says, "Gabe, after the front yesterday, do you think we can still get a buzz bait and walking bait bite this season? Maybe for a little bit farther south. Maybe, yeah. I I don't know. I said that that bite was over last week, but I, obviously, I got a." couple bites on it yesterday i mean it's it's like a day-to-day -day thing right now with well, seven degree temperatures coming this weekend you could you got a really good shot of maybe catching a in the right area at the right time in the afternoon see even on 70 degree days well the nighttime temperatures are key but right. we, the length of day is so short now that you know even even though you got a 70 degree day it's not there's not a lot of time for that water to warm up right you know it, i don't know that it's going to drop but it's definitely not going up. And I think when that water is, um, say it's 49 and maybe it'll warm up a degree and a half in the afternoon, that's your little window to get a bite. You know, like those bites I got yesterday were about two o'clock. 
like 1 30 or 2 o'clock right and i don't know if i would have got those same bites if i would have been fishing in the morning because the water was you know 49 and probably just falling or steady and it started to warm up in the afternoon so there's there's little windows right now um but i don't know that it's a pattern that you can like go run all over the lake and and catch a limit on i, I don't know what do you and think that, and that was um you're talking about fish that are in grass correct mm -hmm. so right. like at lake of the ozarks or table rock or places you know that have more rock oriented type structure for me, it's all going to depend on, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with what we call sharking, like when the gizzard shed, their dorsal fins are kind of sticking up out of the water and they're right up on the bank. So if the gizzard shed are up on the bank, it won't matter if the water is 47 degrees, you better be throwing top water. So, <laughs> but those shad tend to pull out and not be up there when it gets that cold. But for me, that's the first thing that I look at. And at the lake, they jack with the water levels so much that it makes those shad pull off the bank sometimes. When the water actually gets up, the algae is not right on the surface. And so then the shad are out a little bit deeper where that algae is. But when they get right up there on the water's edge, that's some of the best top water fishing at the lake, period. Yeah, and I, and I forgot to mention that bait in the grass is is really key like you know when that water's in the 50s there's a lot of mats that have bait in them and as it gets closer you know to that high 40s well once it gets 50 49 50 a lot of that bait starts leaving the grass the grass kind of starts dying a little bit there's still some green grass over there you kind of gotta you gotta hunt and peck you know a lot of the areas the grass is brown that's not the stuff that's going to hold the fish most of the time if you find that green, you find grass. That green grass and, you, and you'll hear even even on a cold day you'll still hear a little bit of popping that's the kind of stuff that um you, you're going to need to find and it's it becomes less and less as the water cools down and it gets later into the year that's that's kind of why i say it's not it's not a it's almost like a spot thing you're gonna you're not gonna be able to run the whole lake with a frog in your hand but if you've got a couple, if you know the areas where that grass holds on the longest and the bait and the bait stays up in that grass the longest, those are like an area you can run to and just fish it and then leave. It's not a deal where you're just going down the bank and covering the water like you could have like a month ago. So it's it's pretty specific. And if, if you know the lake, you'll know there's a couple places like that that will still hold. They're like the last place that the fish that the bait stays in the grass. Those are the kind of places right now that you can get a bite on a frog around here. Yeah, I, but I think what you said there at the end is the big key for topwater fishing. You need to have, you know, shad or bait fish need to be around there. That's that's probably what I would tell him to reference it on more than anything. Find Definitely. the bait, find the fish. They need groceries to stay alive. They're exactly. Gonna move. Yeah, I got a pocket getter hat right here. There you go. Nice. Boom. I didn't have it on, but it's it's in the background right here. Right there. Really cool hat. That's why I misspelled the name. Because I was thinking crocodile. Right. Right. It's like that K, man. That K just threw me. I'll never forget it. It'll never be misspelled again. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so it all your years of fishing down there in the Lake of the Ozarks. Um have you ever ran across like a Sasquatch or have you heard any kind of Sasquatch stories down there? You know, I, honestly, no Sasquatch. The closest Sasquatch that I can think of is my uh, big fishing partner, Kelly Power. <laughs> I thought you were going to say your father-in-law. He's, he's, he's probably going to hate me for it, but he he's about as close as I can tell you that I've ever seen to a Sasquatch. <laughs> hey, you got, if you can't handle the truth, it's just, that's your own fault. That's right. We were talking to, we were coming back yesterday to weigh in and the wind picked up like, I don't know, it was blowing like 30 miles an hour out of there. And there was these two people in this kayak and they were just struggling, struggling. I felt bad because we only had two minutes to get back. So we blew by them and then we weighed in the fish and we were dumping our fish back in the lake and they had just made it into the, at, to the boat ramp. Right. And they had camped out all night long. Right. And, and had all their stuff in their kayak. And I'm thinking, 
I didn't ask them if they saw a Sasquatch, but I asked them if they saw any Bobcats because, you know, that's really? where, where they were out, that, where they're at out there in um, Shawnee National Forest. It's it's somewhat remote and there's definitely Bobcats out there. I've seen right. a lot of Bobcats. So I don't I don't know. I don't know if I would. have. I don't know. I've seen enough Bobcats that I would be nervous out there camping at night. Exactly. We got all these numbers coming in hot and heavy. So, well, I'll, I'll announce this after we find the winner. I was going to just say, get a hold of me, but Close. what was the number? Okay, we got it. So, what do you got coming up next year, 2022? Are you going to be fishing? Um, what, first of all, what all? What kind of circuits do you fish? I know you fish the Bass and Bob. Yeah. And I, pretty, I pretty much just fish team stuff anymore. Um, my son, my son is uh, does a little bit of fishing. He's really big into golf. But um, he does some high school stuff, so then I captain him for that. For, um, so I got to play that card. And then basically Anglers in Action, Ozark Mountain Team Trail, and Angler's Choice are my main three circuits that I fish. Um, do some of the Just Fish stuff that Randy Brio uh, runs, and then Bass and Bob do some of his winter series. Um, and then every once in a while, I'll jackpot you know, something, whether it be a Toyota series or a BFL and just kind of fly by the seat of my pants. Yeah. I saw a lot of your Facebook pictures with your son. Son is into golf. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nothing wrong with that. No, I figured you guys could, <laughs> could bond on the golf game thing. Yeah. I played a little bit of college golf. So. Oh, did you? Nice. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, he's he's hoping to get a scholarship. He got ninth in state last year as a sophomore. Awesome. Yeah, he has big big plans this year to do better than that. Gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh, long story, but I I played golf all through high school, and then the in town SEMO, Southeast Missouri State University, they got rid of their golf team the year that I graduated high school, and I had a I was going to walk onto that team, no problem. Knew the coach very well. Went to every one of his camps all through high school, and they decided to up and oh. leave the, the program. Wow. It was all, all about dollars. It, the golf didn't bring in any any fan support, so they didn't deem it necessary. So Fishing can kind of have that. Fishing teams can have that rap, too, in a smaller school. Mm -hmm. But we had a fishing team at SEMO. Yeah. So. I, I, I go back and tell my son all the time, I'm like, I pr probably wouldn't be his dad because if they would have had fishing back then, I would have finished college. And I probably would have fished professionally would be my guess. But I made a decision way back then that I decided I wanted to have a family. And at the age both of my children are at and stuff like that, I, I want to be here, you know, as a, as a dad and a father, husband, and do those things. And once they get a little older, I can get back more into it. But I do plenty. I'm still gone quite a bit. My wife's an angel. She takes care of everything. Yeah, that's something... We don't we don't talk about that enough about how thankful we are for our wives that take care of our ch children when we're yeah. deciding to travel the country. Yeah, it's and, a team thing, you know. It's it takes it takes two. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So and then to fish a circuit, you know, to be a bass professional, you're away from home yeah. for months, you know. Yeah, and you leave in January and you come back basically in June. Well, you're only home for a week or here, a week yeah. here, a week there, and. And when you're home, are you really focused? Or are you just getting ready for the next event? You're doing tackle prep and reloading the truck. So yeah. Yeah, I tell I tell people all the time, I'm like, it's it's really a second job. You know, they're like, Oh, you're going fishing, you're gonna have so much fun. I'm like, Well, yeah, there's some fun in it, but when you get to a certain level to where you're changing line every night and cleaning and prepping and organizing and get up early, stay out on the water till dark and don't get to eat until late. I mean, it's just Constant go, go, go. Right. When you fish your team events, do you guys take two separate boats and practice separate? We, mo most of the time, yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Just gives us the ability to cover more areas of the lake. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Now, will you stay, say, say, for instance, Lake of the Ozarks, how spread out will you guys get? Will, will somebody go way up the river and then somebody go towards the dam or? So mo most of the time, because I do have a full-time job, I get one day to go down there and try to 
figure out what the heck's going on and then compete. Um, so we may split up and go two different areas just so that we can cover more water. Um, and then bigger, some of the bigger events, like if it's a championship or something, I'll take some time off of work and usually get a few days to be able to, to practice. Like when we went down to Grand, I think we got three days of practice. So it was nice to be able to really explore a little bit and kind of get some stuff figured out. A lot of times for me, it's more figuring it out the day of the tournament. I mean, the practice day is just maybe eliminating an area of the lake or giving me some confidence in an area of the lake is all it, it really boils down to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a, lot of times, a lot of times those multiple day practices, you're just looking for a practice day. You're looking for that really, really off the wall, obscure. Yeah that nobody else is going to find. I just like a lot of times for me, it's just looking at like water color, water temperature, you know, it's just trying to see, you know, can I get some bites in this area versus less bites in another area? Um, Cause it does, I will say that at Lake of the Ozarks, there's typically a five to 10 mile stretch that will be fishing better than a different five to 10 mile stretch. I mean, there's fish everywhere on the lake from dam to dam. It's one of the greatest fisheries I've ever been to. I mean, it doesn't matter what time of the year you're there, you can always catch fish. It's it's an awesome fishery for sure. Did you fit did you ever did you have a chance to fish it when it did have grass in it? I did not. Nope. But there was, I've heard stories. So my buddy Jay, um, Pulsey. He fished down there and down like in the dam and they're down by the Bagnell Dam and then in the gravel and stuff like that. There was grass in that area. Yep. I have seen the lily pads up in um if lily pads that are way up in the Grand Glaze Arm. I've seen those. I c I couldn't imagine it with grass. It's so good right now. I just you would just think it would be even better if there was some grass oh, yeah. available. Yep, there's no doubt. We got a winner. Really? We got a winner. <laughs> w- William Hiller. Congratulations, man. You're going to get you a nice prize package. Um, so get a hold of me on Facebook at Gabe Montgomery or Gabe Montgomery Fishing or Ten Horse Monty and send me your shipping information. And I will get that over to Joey and she will send you out the Crockett Gator prize package. So congratulations. I think you're going to be real happy with what you're going to receive and um that was fun it was fun i was going to ask you oh you got a question up there um yeah typically typically at the lake um like the bass and bob winter series will end in february and then usually right around the beginning of the march the circuits start so i mean you can the only time i would say they don't have many tournaments at the ozarks is June, July, and August. And if you want to fish a tournament, then it's pretty much going to be a night tournament. Um, there's a few little small tournaments here and there. Um, and it's kind of sad because June's probably the absolute best month to fish on the lake for catching numbers and size. That lake is absolutely bananas in the summertime. <laughs> yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. My in-laws got a place down there and we were down there. It was like first weekend of August and it was just brutal. We, we go down there with the family and basically if you get on the water at five 30 and get off the water at 10 30, you can have good five hours. But other than that, it's recreation time. Yeah. We took the, the, his tri tune out at like, 10 o'clock in the morning and it was already nuts out there. It's like this. Really? Is, yeah. I, I, I don't enjoy that at all. <laughs> right. And I felt bad. I saw a guy in a, you know, 21 foot Ranger running down the lake. It's like, and this it doesn't like matter what two, size your boat you got. It was like two 30 in the afternoon. I'm like, buddy, you are in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the main channel. Just yeah. rolling. Yeah. That lake will crush your stuff. It just folds you up like a little pretzel. Um, I was going to ask you what, what are, let's talk a little bit about winter fishing. Um, we're still kind of late fall winter, but 
when does that when's the jerk bait thing start happening is it going on right now and it, it is it's starting right now for sure yep um you know you have some of the it's all shad related with that stick bait um you know and they're just going to move and the fish are going to move with the shad as it gets colder and you start to have a little bit of shad kill and stuff like that that's when those fish will suspend around or over those brush piles um and then you just want to soak that stick bait right there around the piles. I mean, the other thing is I'm still, I won't lie, I'm still learning with the new forward-facing sonar. I mean, it's its changing the game. I mean, you're looking at what you're catching in the wintertime with that more so than anything. And, you know, the umbrella rig, it's a super powerful tool and easy to see it on the forward-facing sonar. But I hate to say it, but typically if it's, if it's allowed in the event that you're fishing starting probably right about now, I would say going all the way through to the end of March, it's day in and day out. It's going to be the main producer. And I mean, you can still catch them, you know, tie the stick bait in with it, have a jig and tied in there. Um, but like the bass and Bob stuff, it's not allowed. Um, so it just depends on what event you're fishing on, whether you can or cannot throw it. Yeah, I, I know it's, it is what it is with that a rig. Right. <laughs> and then depending on the lake that you're fishing too, they all have certain rules. Well, Illinois has two, most of the lakes in Illinois, we fish in Illinois a lot and you can only have two hooks on your rig. Right. You know, Missouri's three, but there are a few lakes in Illinois where you can have a full five rig, you know, five hook rig. Right. So it's um see my luck there is you know just like usual. They hit the dummy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't throw an A-rig a lot though. So yeah, I, um, I, I don't throw it as, as much as some people do. Um, I guess when it first came out, I was impartial to it, but I think a lot of that was just because I didn't really feel like learning it, and it was a heavy and it was not easy to throw, and it was a lot of work, but once I got the right rod and start putting the time in with it, I mean, the guys that catch them on it, the reason why they catch them is because they're good. They, um, they figure out how to present the bait, where to present the bait. Um, and that's really what it takes. I mean, it's, it's not just, it's just another, another tool in the box. It's not as easy as it used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a technique, you know, I think at one time when you got it, you know, like six, seven years ago, a, a novice angler could look yeah. really good on it, I think. But mm -hmm. I think the fish have gotten educated to it a little bit. Yeah. And like you said, you st it's still about location. You still got to find Absolutely. the fish and yeah. throw it around the fish. I mean, you can throw an A-rig all day long. If you're not around fish, you're not going to bite it. So right. you got to be able to put yourself in the right areas. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what are you throwing the A-rig on? Okay, a couple questions. What, what kind of rod are you throwing it on? Is it, you know... So... So there's a, a buddy of mine and bought me a rod. Um, oh, and I'm not going to be able to tell you the name. It's a Vo, Voselka or Voselka. Um, he, he builds rods. He's out of like California, actually. Um, it's V-O-C-E-L-I-K-A or something like that. That's how it's spelled. But it's a seven foot, 10 inch. And um, he custom built it for me but it's real light has a fast tip i'd call it like a medium heavy um towards the tip and then it's got like a heavy action real stiff in the back end but you can sling it it's lightweight um and i throw pretty much uh i use the lose um heavy duty reel and then um i throw it on 65 pound braid as far as um, Crocagator has the eighth ounce heads. I don't know if they sent you any of them, but they're good little heads. Um, and they work, they work awesome on it. And then um, pretty much just like Kytex. I mean, and there's a lot of things. Strike King has baits out there. Um, it just depends. Anything from a 2.8 to a 4.8. I mean, for your bait size, I'd say day in and day out, the 3.8 is probably what I would throw. say I throw the most. 
Mm -hmm. You got a favorite color? No, white. I guess if if I could only throw one color, probably be white. But I mean, no, I have a garage full of. <laughs> all I, know. Different colors. I know. We did that a couple of years ago in a championship, the USA Bassin Championship. I think it was. There was a chance that an A reg might come into play, and you know you don't want to be five hours from home with your A reg A rig box sitting at home, so. Right. We loaded up a little bit on a rig stuff, and my goodness, I had I didn't have much of it, so I loaded up probably more than I should have, and it's all yeah. still sitting in the bag. <laughs> well, you use them sometime down the road. Yeah. Well, a couple couple years ago at the lake, the water was pretty pretty off colored, and that black shad was working really well. Uh, a lot of times, we'll take the sexy shad when it's sunny, put those on the outside. And then we put one white one in the center and dip the tail chartreuse. Um, lot, you know, a lot of times we'll we'll key that center bait might be a little bigger bait um, or a totally different color. And um, usually we put chartreuse on the center one and then keep everything else pretty natural. So do you have a certain A rig that you lean towards? The only one I throw is uh, made by Hog Farmer. Hog farmer, okay. Yeah, it's it's pricey, but all the components are by far the absolute best components out there. Yeah, I actually got a couple of those when we were going for that tournament. You you're right, they are pricey, but when you get them in the in the mail, it's like, yep, that's the reason yeah. why. Yep, exactly. Darius said he had three smallmouth on the A rig at one time this week. He got two in the boat. You catch a lot of doubles on the A rig. Like I've results. only caught I've only caught one double. Um, I have a lot of buddies. I mean, I've netted a couple for Jay, my my buddy Jay, um, but I I don't throw it that much. I mean, I do like when I have to throw it, but I'm still learning, still learning with it. Won't lie. You ever use a chatterbait in the center? I nope. Okay. Nope, I've, I've heard about it, but I have not personally done it. I haven't either. I've heard about it. Somebody doesn't like the A rig here, Mr. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> the A rig. Well, so if he's, you, he's the one going to Bass and Bob this weekend, so he won't have to worry about it. That's so, right. They don't. That's they right. don't throw them, do they? They they do not allow it. Nope. Yeah, there's a couple circuits around here. The same thing. The the English choice. English allow. choice doesn't allow the A rig. Right. Um, that tournament we fished yesterday, Doug was, you know, putting it on baits. Yeah. And, uh, no. no, no A rigs. No A rigs. Which I wouldn't have thrown it anyway. How crazy is this? Our Angler's Choice division at Lake of the Ozarks, you can throw it at the Ozark division, but you can't throw it at the championship. So go figure. <laughs> it's crazy. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Usually it's across the board. It's like a. Right. You know, a, a rule or something um so three what are your three main baits that you're throwing in the winter time a stick bait a jig and an alabama rig yep i mean that's pretty much in the winter time now leading into winter you can you know take the rock crawler or wiggle ward or something like that crankbait and then going into spring, you know, as soon as your water temperatures get into the middle 45-ish or so, then I'll start breaking out the crankbait. And then when it starts getting 48, closer to 50, the spinnerbait comes into play. Um, but other than that, pretty much jig, stick bait. Stick bait and the rig are what you're going to win on most of the time. Now, when it gets real slick, that's when that jig can play play dividends sometimes when they, you know, those suspended fish just won't react to the, to the rig or to a stick bait very well, then you can slow down and catch them on a jig. So with the A rig and the jerk bait, you know, it's like you're kind of targeting the same fish to a point. Do you, how do you, um, how do you decide which one you're going to throw on any given day? Well, for me, for me, they're not they're not the same fish. Um, st stick bait fish are typically going to be much shallower. Um, 
I mean, they're gonna they're both gonna be more on flatter style banks. Um, but the A rig fish, they could be on steeper banks. Um, they can be on you know suspended underneath boat docks um, or suspended over the top of brush piles, and they can be out brush that's in say 20 feet of water or 15, 20 feet of water. And they're down in 18 feet of water or 15 feet of water. Typically with the stick bait, I'm going to be targeting stuff that's in water less than 10 foot deep. And yeah, there can be brush there and stuff like that. Um, and I will tell you that when I started with the Alabama rig fishing, I went and threw it exactly where I throw my stick bait and I couldn't catch them. And I'd throw a stick bait and catch them. So that's why I say the guys that are good at it, they've definitely learned. Um, the umbrella rig fish that you catch are different, typically a different class of fish over deeper water um, if you're going to do really well with them. Now, as it warms up and you get your water temperature start getting in the upper, you know, 40s, low 50s, then yeah, you can take that that rig and just run it around almost like a spinner bait. You can throw it anywhere and you can catch some fish that way. But it's definitely different in the dead of winter. Gotcha. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I guess I was referring to, you know, um, fishing a jerk bait. You're fishing suspended fish a lot of times. Sure. So I guess I guess the difference is that A rig, you're throwing it out a lot deeper. Something yeah. where a jerk bait is not able to get down to. Exactly. Do you throw if you're fishing out there in 20 foot of water with an A-rig, are you going quarter ounce heads, eighth ounce heads, or what's your theory I, on that? I still throw eighth ounce. I mean, you still have all the baits on there and then the wire and everything's heavy enough to get it down there. But I will say, like at Table Rock, we were fishing even deeper than that. And we were going to quarter ounce heads. And a lot of times you can just put one, say, in the center, put a heavier one in the center. Or um, so like where we can throw three, the top two, I always put the dummies on there so that the weights on the bottom to pull it down just helps it to write faster whenever you're reeling it. If the two dummies are on top, because it's going through the water column at a, straighten up faster yeah do you use a do you cut the bend off of a hook on those dummies or you just use no, a screw lock i i use a hitchhiker screw lock gotcha yeah it seems to hold them on there really well uh ron says um you ever throw a mop jig i i, I have thrown a, a mop jig a little bit um can't say that I've ever done it in the winter time. I've done it in the summer, um, but it just, I have not thrown it that much to, to really truly give them a honest opinion on it. Gotcha. What about spoon bite? You ever get on a spoon bite or like a blade bite or anything down there? No, no, not, not really. I don't know. Um, it's pro it's probably something that we need to be, looking for you know like all that Tamiki rig stuff that's going on and it's it's probably happening there if we ever spend the time to figure it out i just i don't have enough time like when i get to the lake it's like i better get busy and figure out what i'm going to do yeah. for the next day so the guys that live down there some want to figure it out but it, it has to be happening there has to be fish suspended out in them creeks and somebody figures out how to catch them. And that's what happened with the A-Rig. A lot of those fish that those guys catch are out there off the bank a ways and, you know, they're not getting pressured. Man, when we retire someday, it's coming. There you go. We'll be able to get out there four or five days a week. Right. And all this little niche stuff, we'll be able to figure it out. I know what you mean, man. It's hard to go get one day a week to fish, maybe two days on a good week and, and, go over there and try, you know, start doing exp you know, experimenting and stuff. It's, I don't know. It's just, uh, there's just not enough time. You got to get over there and figure it out quickly. What, right. what's some of your jerk baits that like, uh, do you have a certain brand or two that you're partial to and, and some of the colors? Um, you know, I, I pr pretty much throw the mega bass 
110, Vision 110. I've got some of the RC sticks. Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a fan of stick baits. I'm not a fan of crank baits. Anything that has a treble hook, I'm not really a fan <laughs> of. But, but I throw them because I have to. Like my, my motto is if it has a single hook, it's for me. So, <laughs> Nothing yeah. wrong with that. But yeah. as, as far as colors, I've got way too much money invested in all of them. Um, the sunny days, typically I throw shiny colors, cloudy days, dull colors, like Edo Natural would be what I would call my go-to on a cloudy day. Uh, Pro Blue is always a good color, you know, sunny, cloudy, whatever. Some of the pearl whites, I mean, I don't know all the names of them, but. Uh, yeah, there's so many different yeah shade variations and stuff in that mega bass lineup it's like they got i don't know how many colors 68 it's colors at of, least and they're the vision one a lot of them are really really close but that's that's kind of I, I just did a jerk bait a little jerk bait video i'll probably be dropping it this week but you know for me it's like french pearl like gold chrome black back and then pro blue so right. you know something hard, something flashy, and then something kind of halfway translucent, yeah. and then and then just kind of work from that. That's kind of your three. Yeah. To me, that's your three. Well, for colors. me, it's just it, just like anything else. Favorite colors are green pumpkin. I mean, I would say ninety nine point nine percent of fishermen that's one of their favorite colors. You know, it's it's whatever you like, whatever you got confidence in. I mean, I got I'm like you, Mark. I got way too much money wrapped up in my jerkbait box and i still go grab the same three jerkbaits every time i open the box like, yep. why right. do i have all these colors because exactly. they're pretty and i like them <laughs> Get right. to me every time right. so. exactly well because you have you, you know if if you have a day like like a green pumpkin if you ever have a day on a green pumpkin purple like green a really good day, then that's your color, and then maybe you'll come back to just the regular yeah. green pumpkin. Yeah, you're right. You're that's right. how that's how you get magic swirl. Then you have a sprayed grass day. Where yeah, you catch them on a sprayed grass, and <laughs> next thing you know, you got 27 colors in your lineup. Yeah, like, you'll eventually come back to the center. green pumpkin. Yeah, come back to green pumpkin. <laughs> oh man! So I how do you like my, that charger boat? The boat's awesome. Like, truly yeah, awesome. yeah. It's, how long uh, you been with in a charger? Uh, so that was that was the third one that I've had, and I just turned it back in. And the I guess it'd be either the end of the month or sometime next month. I should be getting the new one for 2022. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, nice boats. it's a one hell of a fishing platform, and surprisingly, the the last one I had was pretty darn quick. Um, like gps in 73 ish by myself i could see 74 um but it's like second no boat in my opinion it can ride as good as it does in big waves rough water which is what we encounter at lake of the ozarks especially in like september and just i don't know just nice to have that comfort level there yeah, I've rode in one. I was we were we were talking the other day, and I got to ride in one on the second day of the Toyota series down there at Lake of the Ozarks. It was a, a two ten, I believe. Yep. And um, it was nice. It was a very solid boat. I was impressed with it. That's that's the only one I've ever been in. And you know, Say, out of all the BFLs that I fished, I've never rode in a Charger. So yeah, it's a, it's a good boat. It's a good platform. Yeah, they're they're nice. Live wells are big. They're deep. They've got the oxygenators and all the recirculation. I mean, all the boats truly are, they've came quite a ways in the last 10 years, in my opinion. Um, but some some of them don't ride as well as others. I will say that. What's the Shimano World Minnow? That's that new, like, vibrating jerk it? bait. Yeah. I have not seen that yet. I'm not familiar with it either. Oh. That was released at iCast. Huh. Come on, keep up. I I'm, I'm, I just got some <laughs> Berkeley Stunnas. By the way, those are pretty good jerk baits. Um, if you're looking for something besides Mega Bass, that Berkeley Stunna is a pretty good jerk bait. Let's see. Okay, here's a uh, Ron says, being with Charger, are you familiar with Trey McKinney? 
He's over in Southern Illinois. He's a younger guy, college. Uh, he just graduated, I think. But he he won the college classic bracket last year and was able to fish the Bassmaster Classic. Awesome. Uh, he's, with, he's with Charger. Yeah, I'm, I'm. no, I haven't met him yet. Okay. Really nice guy. I'm sure you'll run in. Run into him. He's gonna be, he's gonna be around for a while fishing these tournaments. He's, I think he's fishing. Well, he fished all, I think all three divisions of the Open Bassmaster this Opens this year. So he's trying to work his way up. But it's kind of kind of that deal where, if you get in it when you're young, versus <laughs> getting in it getting yeah. in it when you're older, yeah, a big difference. Um, I wish we had college fishing. When I'm I'm a little bit older than him. We didn't have high school or college fishing or any of that. I, sh- it, it I got in on it just a little bit of it. I didn't get on all, in when it was good. But I, I will say that I got in on it when when we went to Dardanelle, and there was like five glass boats there, and everybody else was in their, you know, dad's bass tracker. Right. Or, you know, it was it wasn't the smaller stuff. Yeah, it wasn't the stuff. big. Everybody's got a rat boat. It was. I remember first, see at that time, you know, we saw three nitro Z nines, and we were all like, "Man, I, we would love to have one. We'd like to go fast like that." And the rest of us were just out there in little, you know, we were fishing out of a nineteen and a half foot with a ninety on it, and thought we were just top dogs and did well in most of those tournaments just out of that boat. But right. you know, now it's got to the point where it's it's about you know, it's the elite series level stuff. Yep. Guys, got any more questions here coming up on what well, we've been on here about two hours? It's been a great conversation. Covered a lot of ground and um, touched on a lot of good topics. So, what what do you uh you work for? Is it? I wrote it down here. Triple A Remodeling Company. Is that your yep. current? Job? Yep. That's that's what kind of work you guys do. Uh, primarily kitchen and bathroom remodeling up in the. St. Louis area. Okay. Yeah, I'm in sales. Probably that's how you met Jay. Again, right? Do what now? That's probably how you met Jay Beffa. Um, no, when I met Jay through through bass fishing, actually. Um, but but we've definitely talked, you know, as he got into the flooring side of it and all that stuff. But he's. I think they're more into the commercial side of it. We're more into residential. Andy says, don't be hating on Bass Tracker. I ain't hating on Bass Tracker. You know, you're going to upset our, our folks out there. Oh, I'm not hating on Bass Tracker. Um, I fish out of a tracker. What are you talking yeah, you about? Did. That's right. <laughs> Todd wants to know, what, is, what was your most memorable tournament win? Do you have one that comes to mind? Beffa asked that while ago, too. Did he? Yeah. Oh, well, that one's easy. So this past spring, uh, we had 20, let's see if I get this right. We had 28 pounds, five fish. It was actually like 27.84 to be exact. Um, and it was in a high school tournament where I got to fish with my son and then his partner. So the three of us competed. My son caught three five pounders my son's partner caught a seven pounder and i caught one fish but together we had 27 80 something and it was like the heaviest stringer that's been weighed in on lake of the ozarks and since the 30 pound stringer was weighed in in omtt so that was probably probably my most memorable just for the boys sake because i told them like guys i've been fishing on lake of the ozarks for well over 20 years and i have a a lot of 25 pound bags but no nothing even close to that and so they'll probably never catch five fish that weigh that much in the state of missouri ever again in their life and it just happened for them like just one of those days well don't say in the state of missouri because all they gotta do is come a little bit farther south and they'll be and then it'll happen yeah all right like wapapello yeah wapapello has got some good it's been pumping out 30 pound bags really yeah, about one or two a year. Sleeper, sleeper lake. Yeah. How, how many lower units get replaced there a year? <laughs> quite, a quite a few. few if you quite a few, especially up in the river, man. You get up in that right. river, you get over, you're going. 
Well, you it, you only you only have to take one out before you learn where that stump is at. There you go. There you go. You can put a waypoint on yeah, it. Yeah, you put a waypoint on yeah. it. Then. Isn't that how you mark? Isn't that how you're supposed to mark them? Is just hit them with your lower unit? That's expensive. Yeah. You see a lot of guys running jet boats down there. I would imagine. My my motto: trim it high and let it fly. There you that's go. That's right. That's right. That's if you don't see, if you don't see it, it's not there. That's right. Until you hit it. Um, oh gosh. Well, cool, man. We're gonna we're probably gonna wrap this up. It's getting a little bit late. Had a great awesome. time. Um, anything? Any shout outs you want to give before we before we shut this down, or anything else you want to touch on? No, I I appreciate you guys having me on. It's been great. Hopefully, we got everybody's questions answered, and we can do it again sometime. Sounds good. Sounds good, man. I'm looking hey, forward to it. Big thanks to Crocagator. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, William, get a hold of me. Give me your um, contact information, shipping information, and we'll get that stuff out to you here probably in the next week or so. But um, yeah, Mark, had a great time. It's nice hanging out with you. Good to meet you and stuff. And uh, yep. maybe sometime down the road, we'll definitely do this all over again. It was It was a great show. A lot of good content and valuable information shared. I always go back and watch these the next day because when you're in the middle of it, you you don't catch all the little details and stuff. So tomorrow I'll be watching right. this and, and learning a little bit more. Awesome. So, all right. Thanks everybody that um, was on here tonight. It was a great show. Hope you guys got a lot out of it and we will see you next Monday at seven 30.